Welcome back, everybody, to Bio 2022 here in San Diego. I'm Greg Slobotkin, Editor-in-Chief of ScienceBoard.net, and I have the great privilege of having with me Tom Isaac, who is CEO of iBio. Welcome. Great. Nice to be with you, Greg. Absolutely. And so let's start with iBio. Tell us about your company, its history, and, and what, uh, you know, what you're trying to do to the market. Oh, sure, sure. Well, I mean, the, uh, the history and the transformation that we've undergone in just really the past year, year and a half is quite something. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But uh, we're excited about what we've become, starting from uh, being a contract development and manufacturing organization. We've moved through to begin producing our own proprietary uh, drugs, both vaccines and therapeutics. And we're using a combination of technologies, one being AI, powered drug development, if you will, but importantly, too, we're looking to speed the time to clinic through our manufacturing platforms as well, and one of them is quite novel and unique. We use the power of plants to make glycoproteins, monoclonal antibodies, vaccine antigens, and so it's an exciting time here for the company because uh, very recently we've been able to, uh, with these technologies, We've built a whole uh, portfolio and pipeline of new immuno-oncology therapeutics, and we have two vaccines in development as well. That's incredible. So talk to me a little bit about plant-based technology. I mean, what, what are the benefits? It sounds like speed to market is definitely one of them. Well, it's huge. And from someone who's been involved in the industry using traditional manufacturing and development techniques, so basically the you know, genetically engineered mammalian cells is how most of the industry makes monoclonal antibodies and a lot of the more advanced biological medicines, right? Well, those are often plagued by, you know, really lengthy processes to get, uh, as the name monoclonal antibody implies, you know, you've got to get a, a, a clone built and developed and there's, you know, a master cell bank that has to be created and there's a lot of time and expense that goes into the development of those cells that are going to produce the monoclonal antibody. Well, with plants, you get to skip all of the master cell bank development because we don't genetically engineer the plant. We use a little trick, which is that our plants have an incredibly weak immune system. So they're susceptible to infection by a certain type of bacteria. So what we do is we drop our gene of interest into the bacteria, then infiltrate those bacteria into the leaves of the plants, and we let them take over the plant machinery, and voila, you get each leaf of the plant starting to then produce the product or monoclonal antibody or protein of interest in the leaves, and by virtue of that, we can save months and months and months of development time. And also because of the nature of the system, when you're saving the time, you're also saving the money. Uh, but then also the expense associated with the upfront work in the plants. I mean, it's just all natural raw materials. We're using some seeds and a uh, little substrate that we call rock wool and some purified water. So, um, you know, we, we are in position to also knock out a lot of the expense. So you call this fast farming, as yep. I understand yep. it? Yeah. And, and, and it's- and With it's, a PH, fast with a pH, farming, yeah. not the exactly. F-A-R-M-I-N-G. Right. But, but so this is for both therapeutics and vaccines? Yeah, it's, it's, the system has some really wonderful versatility. As, as you may know, there's a lot of systems where if you're in, uh, you know, if you're doing small molecules, there's certain chemistries. If you're doing uh, monoclonal antibodies, you're in these Chinese hamster ovary cells and crazy uh, other, other wild systems. Um, so usually it's one system for one thing. Um, similarly with microbial, but they can't do glycoproteins very well. So here, uh, we're in a position where you can make antigens very, very cost effectively in the system. It does extremely well with monoclonal antibodies. And there's another technology that we get to apply which we call our glycaneering technology, where we can also design the glycans or the sugars that go on to or are specifically excluded from addition to the molecule, and that can create uh, more potent monoclonal antibodies. And we've been able to produce some enzymes in some other systems. So um, it's not perfect, it doesn't do everything great, but it's got uh, remarkable versatility versus some of the other systems that are out there. And, and so in terms of therapeutics, uh, what, what are the target areas for those? Yeah, for us, I mean, just because of the strength of the glycaneering platform and being able to make 
uh, monoclonal antibodies with greater ADCC or antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. There's your mouthful for the day. Everybody <laughs> else, it rolls off their tongue a lot better. Uh, but um, with that capability, we've really focused in the area of immuno-oncology and why. Well, if you take a look at that space, you know what the world's like. You've got, if you, for every five to 10,000 concepts that are out there, five, maybe make it to IND, right? Mm -hmm. So you have this massive failure rate, but in along the way of those five getting to the clinic, what's happening? Well, you're spending four to five years and call it $25 million or thereabouts to get to that point. So what we think is important is let's get out of the hunt and peck method for new antibody design and development, and instead use predictive algorithms to design better antibodies with better binding capabilities, and then use the speed of the fast farming system so that you have candidates moving from concept through discovery and into the clinic much more effectively, quickly, speedily, with better design. So increase the opportunity for success decrease the cost and time for those still many molecules who will never make it all the way, and uh, put the whole industry in a position where maybe we can take down that time and expense, not 10 or 15%, but maybe 50%, maybe 60. Um, so that's uh, what we're seeing there, again, with the opportunity to do uh, particularly well with more pod molecules in immune oncology. That's our real focus. You know, we haven't necessarily selected certain cancer indications, but for some of the ones that we're in development for, these are some oftentimes very hard to treat cancers. And because of the nature of the platform, there's one other important thing to note in terms of what we can do um, for patients everywhere, which is that, as you know, there's many rare cancers for which there's not very many patients globally. So hard to justify the expense and time involved with uh, patient populations and markets that maybe have 100 people globally. Well, because our platform is kind of modular, if you will, like if we need more protein, we don't necessarily scale up into, you know, what's called a bigger bioreactor where you're moving from, you know, 100 liters to uh, you know 1,000 liters or 2,000 liters and up. Rather, if we need more protein, we just plant more plants. And if you only need a little bit of protein, well, we just plant a few plants. <laughs> so you're also leveraging artificial intelligence, right? Yeah. So we've got a relationship, just last year, it was about a year ago, where we announced that we were standing up our own drug discovery capabilities uh, here in San Diego. And that's to go along with our manufacturing and uh, business headquarters, which is in the Bryan College Station area of Texas. And so uh, we began hiring into the team, quickly got it up to about a dozen or so, and we've, uh, that team's already been working, but in and along the way, we also formed a relationship with a company by the name of Rubric Therapeutics. And they bring some truly novel uh, predictive algorithms to this world of pharmatech, where you're looking at uh, you know, artificial intelligence to do better binding. They have a, a particular way in which they have these meso-scaled and engineered molecules. Um, and they test them in silico, and then we go ahead and test them in the real world. So um, that, our first program with them began, I want to say, really just even kicked around the concept in October. Mm -hmm. And here you get to see the power of what happens with better design that particular candidate moved through the early stages of discovery and development much quicker than the other traditional ways in which we were doing our other candidates. And um, it, it already leapfrogged the other ones that we had in development. Yeah. The, the other product area I want to talk about is vaccines. And, and so what are those targeted towards? Well, look, I mean, the, uh, the company in our facility in Texas has a very interesting history in that it was originally built with money from the Department of Defense's DARPA Blue Angel project. And it's 130,000 square feet designed to use these plant systems to do what? Well, to rapidly produce medical countermeasures in the event of a pandemic. So we had just changed our strategy in 2019 to not only be a contract manufacturer for others, 
but to use the technologies in this wonderful manufacturing space to do our own product development. So we had a, uh, an animal health candidate, uh, classical swine fever, which can really affect the pork industry. And we hadn't really done much in uh, other human vaccines, right? We had fibrosis and some other stuff that we were working on on the therapeutic side. So then uh, something happened in uh, January of 2020, I think it was. Yes. And uh, the SARS-CoV-2 reared its head. And so we said, all right, well, well, I'll speak for myself. This wasn't a way. I, I kind of took a look at it. I said, well, this will be just like SARS-CoV-1 and Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. I started out life as a microbiologist. Uh, so I'm sitting there going, this will be all over in about four months. Everybody will panic and that'll be done. But we said, let's go ahead and prove, you know, this uh, capability here. And within five weeks, we had developed not one, but two spike protein antigens against the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus, which of course rivals the speed of the mRNA guys. Yeah, sure does. Right, and so quite honestly, I felt like if we had made this move a couple of years earlier, because your Pfizer's and Moderna's <laughs> have been at it for 12 years now, right? right? But if we had been a little bit earlier with this, I think we would have been part of the solution that we see now. But what we did is after it was clear that the other uh, first generation vaccines with those spike antigens were going to get approval, thank goodness, and you know, proved to be safe. Nevertheless, by the time we got to October of 2020, you know, we, we anticipated, look, there's going to likely be variants here because that's the part of the virus Absolutely. for which there's all that natural selection to want it to change and mutate so it can keep docking with our own cells in our lungs, right? right. So we, um, we and our scientists said, okay, well, if there needs to be a next generation vaccine, if, this is before the British variant came out, well, what would that look like? And our guys, they did it again, right? So they identified this area of the virus. It's actually on the inside, mm -hmm. something called the nucleocapsid protein. And we designed a specific region and an antigen to go along with it and put that under test. And we were able to produce it very, very quickly. And I'm happy to say that here, despite all these mutations that have come around, there's yet to be one inclusive of Omicron that shows any change in that area of our antigen. So we're at the point right now where we're um, finishing up some challenge study data, and we would expect to submit it in IND in and around the uh, you know start of 2023. Wow, that's very exciting. Very cool, right? Um, so let me ask you this as a final question. All right, we're here at Bio 2022, and obviously due to the pandemic, this is the first time in three years. You're right. We we're, we're all out here. Be it's together. great. It's great. So what, what's your big takeaway from the show so far? Uh, well, I think first it was just everybody getting to come out to yeah. sunny San Diego and show up. I mean, it's, it's been terrific. Uh, I think the part, I think there's all this pen up activity, right? It's sure, we've all done the, the 2D work uh, <laughs> and had our, had our various uh, meetings face to face in that weird way. But there's nothing like this, you know, having the, you know, the energy and the vibe, uh, the chance when you've got more than, you know, two people for folks to speak and interact and, right. and do all that work. And it just seems like the show's been great. We've had a tremendous amount of uh, partnering activity, both um, for what we're doing on in licensing and therapeutic development, as well as for our uh, commercial services. And it just seems like even though, uh, you know, there's there's all sorts of interesting times for biotech uh, sure. with the capital markets, um, the science still keeps moving. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's always amazing what our industry's been able to do and keep doing. And I think it was a huge win for everything that we did just to, you know, be able to show the world that we can bring these vaccines to market in a pandemic. And at the same time now here too, still drive incredible solutions for cancer patients and so many more. So uh, I, I just think it's been great and it's great getting the chance here to spend a little bit of time with you too, Greg. Absolutely. Tom, it's been great and uh, appreciate your time. And uh, please stay with us for continuing coverage of Bio 2022 from San Diego.